Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it, people of old received their commendation. By faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. By, by faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous. God commending him by accepting his gifts, and through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death. And he was not found, because God had taken him. Now before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. And without faith it is impossible to please him, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists, that he rewards those who seek him. By faith Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this he condemned the world by become and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called out of out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to a city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive, even when she was past the age since she considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man, and him as good as dead, were born descendants, as many as the stars of heaven, as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return but as it is they desire a better country that is a heavenly one therefore god is not ashamed to be called their god for he has prepared for them a city by faith abraham when he was tested offered up isaac and he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son of whom it is said through isaac shall your offspring be named he considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. By faith, Isaac invoked future blessings on Jacob and Esau. By faith, Jacob, when dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph, bowing in worship over the head of his staff. By faith, Joseph, at the end of his life, made mention of the exodus of the Israelites and gave directions concerning his bones. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw the child was beautiful and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking forward to the reward. By faith he left Egypt, not being afraid of the anger of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. By faith he kept the Passover and sprinkled the blood so the destroyer of the firstborn might not touch them. By faith the people crossed the Red Sea as on dry land, but the Egyptians when they had attempted to do the same, were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encircled for seven days. By faith, Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient, because she had given friendly welcome to the spies. What more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David, and Samuel, and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lion, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection. Some were tortured, refusing to accept release, so that they might again, so that they might rise again to a better life. 
Others suffered mocking and flogging, even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sewn in two. They were killed with the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy. Wandering about in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth, and all of these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better for us, that apart from us, they might not be made perfect. In reading something like this, one of the things that you'll notice or, or that you should have noticed as, as we went through this scripture is that by faith is the start of so many of the answers, of, of the examples. By faith, by faith, by faith. It is often not seen or you may not have seen that there are actually sections throughout this scripture that talk about why or they are grouped as to why the individuals are being used as examples of faith. The first three that we look at, and this will, this will only uh, later when we start looking at the examples to us, follow the uh, paper that the handout in your, that you have handed out. Is that better? No? The first group that we look at is Abel, Enoch, and Noah. It is by faith that they could die. That is why these first three are used, in my opinion, and, and you'll have to forgive me if I get some of the things wrong. I do not mean to speak for the mind of God, but only looking at things as he might have given them. And so as he might have given it, you have three people that died and their death is what is discussed. First Abel in verse 4, Enoch in 5, and then Noah in verse 6. Abel, although dead, because of his faith, is still able to speak. That's weird. That's peculiar. Dead people don't talk. That's why it's difficult for so many murders and why so many murders go unsolved. Enoch died, but he didn't die. He just wasn't anymore. The Hebrew and the Greek and the way that they read, uh, our English is, is a little bit peculiar. We have to add words so that we understand what is being said. But what is said is, is that Enoch walked with God and he wasn't. He wasn't what? He just wasn't anymore. He was just not. And so he was not alive on this earth. And then Noah, because of his actions, is saved from death. And we are told that that is done by faith. In verses 11 through 16, you have the examples of Abraham and Sarah. Or 8 through uh, 16, you have Abraham and Sarah. Abraham departed his known life. For a promised land is, is what is discussed about him specifically in these verses. He departs everything about his life. He leaves his life and goes to live in a promised land. And Sarah considers herself dead, considers her husband dead. They have no future. And because of their faith in God, they are given a son, which in Israelite culture is a future and so you get to verses 13 to 16 and you have this lesson of there being a home prepared elsewhere and that these who are looking at it from the old testament they can't read it the way we can we'll we'll discuss that in a moment but there's an eternal home prepared and so you have these heroes of faith that are mentioned in the preceding verses who know that they are not of this world. They start acting different. They start living different than all of the other people in the world. They do so by faith because they know that this world is not their home. They're just a passing through. They see, and it's because their treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue, that they act differently they become a different kind of people 
they're looking for something different and Abraham is told uh, we're told about Abraham again that he is he's knowing of something called resurrection and if you'll read through your Bible, you won't see assurance of resurrection in the Old Testament. You won't see that there is, if you'll do this, you'll live eternally with God. And yet that theme is there. That being pleasing to God means that you will be reunited with Him in the future. Abraham knows of, speaks of, or if you, if you read certain translations, he reckons that God will raise up his son, resurrect his son to life. In verses 20 to 20 through 22, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph timelessly plan for a future that goes beyond the span of their own lives. They look for a future that may be accomplished or may be brought to fruition after their own lives. In verses 23 to 28, we see that Moses' parents refuse to terminate life. Moses chooses eternal life rather than the pleasures of sin. And his reasoning begins a transition. His reasoning in verses 27 and 28 is that he respects one power and does not respect a different kind of power. The power he respects being eternal. The power of the destroyer, the power of God, and not the power of the Pharaoh. So far, we've looked at death, at futures, and at life or the termination of life. And one of the things that we ought to really understand as we go through Hebrews a, a Hebrews 11 in this hall of faith or hall of fame of faith is that faith enables continuance specifically the continuance of life and so that by faith life is continued in every single one of these examples by faith Abel's life is continued even through death by faith Enoch doesn't even die by faith Noah is saved from certain death and the deliverance of life is a theme throughout, bringing us to where you have more talk of less life. In verse 29, you have the people that cross the Red Sea on dry land, but the Egyptians who do not, and that they are drowned. And then there you read of the continuance or the deliverance of one life and the cessation of the other and the difference between the two is their faith. In verses 32 to 35, you have all of these examples of life being continued or life being altered or life being changed. And even in verse 35, we read of the return to life in resurrection. The known constant, keeping them constant, is their faith. Their faith is infinitely more valuable to them because their life is more valuable. And you have these who are martyred, suffering mocking and flogging, chains, imprisonment, stoning, being sawn in two, killed with the sword, they go about hiding and disguising themselves. And the thing that keeps them able to be persistent is knowing that this world is not their home they're just a passing through they can focus on and they know for sure uh, for assurance that they have a treasure laid up they have a life that will continue beyond what they have here on this earth and it is infinitely more valuable than the pain that they have to go through while they're here and because of their strength because of their faith the Bible says that the world is not worthy. Why not? Because the world is full of sin. And yet these individuals were holy. That's the kind of holy I want to be. That's the kind of faith I want to have. And that's the kind of faith that 
I would hope you want to have. And I'm certain that because it's saved for us like this, that God wants us to have this strength of faith as well. All of these things are well and good. And the chapter ends with an encouragement to you to be even stronger than these people. All of these, verse 39, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better for us, that apart from us, they should not be made perfect. There's a difference in them and us. They didn't get the whole story. Paul Harvey didn't finish with them. And yet the Apostle Paul did finish for us so much more of the New Testament so much of these lessons saved for us that we would be able to see and understand have strength of our faith so that's what the old testament examples are what does it mean to us well backing up to verse one Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Faith, whenever you're looking at yourself and your relationship with God, is I am sure. I know, and we sing songs like, I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which he has committed or I have committed against him until that day. Do you know for sure that God will save you? Do you know for sure that your relationship with him is one that he will not forsake you? That you are in his hand? After faith is explained to you as to what it is, the examples are given. And because of the way that rolls out in verse 2, for by it people of old, it is not a, hey, there's an example and it should mean nothing to you. It's a, you need to look at the faith of Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Sarah, all the way through here. We need to be looking at them and saying, I can have faith like this. I can have faith like this. If you think that there is too great a gulf between yourself and them, you don't give yourself enough credit and perhaps even you give them too much. Jesus came to save your soul. You are valuable. You mean something to God. Faith is about the things that are unseen. By faith we understand, verse 3, that the universe was created by the Word of God so that what is seen or not, uh, what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. There are questions that will never be answered until the sky rolls back and you get to stand in front of God Almighty and say, tell me of your majesty. How do women work? Or how is the world put together? Or how do all of these things, why gravity and how is it? And we will not know the answers until we can ask Him directly. Because there are things that are intangible, not touchable, not attainable. These are things that we take by faith. Abel, Enoch, and Noah are four, five, six, and seven. Abel serves God even to his death, even through his death. And so the example is for us to maintain our faith no matter what the cost might be. Enoch serves God even when the reward is far beyond his wildest dreams. And I, I believe these two are used as an extreme example. The first man who served God well in Scripture is murdered by his brother. And in the future, even after this example, or rather this precedent is set, Enoch continues to serve so well to honor his God in such a wonderful way that God takes him from this earth that he does not see death. And in verse 7, whatever your situation is in between, know that God will save you. Know that everyone who God does not save will perish but God will save you. And the most important 
verse for us in this chapter, or one of the most important for us in this chapter, is verse 6. Highlight that. Underline that. Write it on your arm. Write it on the ceiling of your car. Don't do that if you're a kid. Your mama may not like that. But look at verse 6 with me. And without faith it is impossible to please Him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that He exists and He rewards those who seek Him. Without faith it is impossible to please Him. So by faith let God change your life. When you get down to verse 8 through 12 and you're talking about Abraham and Sarah, you have the example of those whose life is changed. Abraham leaves his blessing for an another blessing, a promised land. I hope you saw that when we talked about Abraham in this spot earlier. Abraham's life is changed. God says, get up and go, and he does, and he receives a promised land. In verse 9, he steadfastly awaits his blessing. In verse 10, he maintains eternity, or he maintains that promise of God as his focus. And he it knows that he's looking forward to a city without builder other than God. I'm trying. <laughs> Sarah considers herself dead, considers her husband dead. So in the the old world culture, specifically in the, the Israelite culture, life actually has a lot of different definitions. If you don't have anything to eat and you're starving, you're considered dead. Why? Because you're going to die. You have no way to continue. If you have no land, you're considered dead. Why? Because you have no place to be. If you have no children, you're considered dead. Why? Because when you get old, I'm told that as you get older, your body begins to ache and it doesn't work the way you want it to anymore. And sometimes it doesn't work at all. And without children to help you, you cannot maintain either your food or your place of residence and this is where sarah considers herself that her, both her and abraham are old there is no future for them and because of her faith she receives children innumerable and actually here through the promise given to sarah fulfilled between her and abraham not only is there life for her and Abraham, but comes from their seed, the offspring of David, the offspring of Abraham, Jesus our Christ, to give eternal life to us. All of this coming from a woman who considers herself dead. Sarah goes from producing no life to producing eternal life. And we see in verse 13, this all starts with a changed mindset. All these died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on earth. No matter where they were or who they were, no matter where they resided, that they were not going to be the people of this world. Verse 14, for people who speak thus make it clear that they were seeking a homeland. I've got somewhere better to be. Is this the way that we approach our daily lives? Because so much of what we want to do, and especially what we want to do as Americans, is to increase ourselves here on this earth. And so by request, we sang 401. Here we are but straying pilgrims before our lesson. Can we maintain that thought process day to day, knowing that we have somewhere better to be? Greeting from afar our salvation, having not yet fully realized it. Do we have the assurance of hope, the assurance of heaven so strongly that we can live like Abraham, Sarah, like all of these that are mentioned in this chapter, looking forward to a better future, a better home. Can we change our mindset? Can we have senioritis? 
some of the seniors wanted to have senioritis and they didn't even get to have it. So they kind of had that inverted this year. But have you ever seen someone, if you do not remember what senioritis is, have you ever seen someone who had put in their papers for retirement? That is the happiest employee on the face of the earth, isn't it? When you put in your papers for retirement or when you put in your papers to leave your two week notice or, or whatever it is to go to new employment, why? Because you're out of here. They can't fire you. People want to ask you questions, you can answer them and know that you don't have to deal with whatever it is that they have to deal with in a very short amount of time. I'm out of here in two weeks, I'm out of here in a month, I'm whatever it is, I'm gone. I'm not long for this, this occupation, this semester of school, I'm not long for this world, I got a better place to be. And so that you even see it in some terminally ill patients that because they know they are not long for this world and that they are closing in on the world to come, they focus on that and the mundane things of this world does, do not, mundane things of this world don't get them down because they don't have to deal with them for very much longer. That can be a scary thing for some. But for those who live by faith, it should be the focus of the mindset. These people cannot wait to go home. Verse 16, as it is, they desire a better country. That is a heavenly one. And God's not ashamed of them. God loves that. They know that they have a better place to be and they hold to it so much that they begin to speak for God. They talk for Him. Now, understand, I'm not saying that they're disrespectful and understand that I'm not saying that they cause God to do things that He would not otherwise do. But their relationship has changed so much that they can speak for their God because they know Him like a father. Your children know how you behave. They know what is expected of them and they know what the result will be if you if you do if they behave in that way. They know what the result will be if they don't behave in a certain way. And in this case you see in verses 17 through 22 people speaking for God. Abraham reckons his son will be saved. Why? Because he knows God is not a God of death, but one that wants to continue, give, restore, increase life. In verse 20, we have the conveyance of blessings. Speaking for God, knowing that blessings will be continued. And in verse 21 by faith Jacob when dying blessed each one of the sons of Joseph bowing in worship over the head of his staff your worship is so impactful that it will be a blessing to people you don't even know I know a man who prays like he is sitting next to God like God is his uncle that comes in every now and again and allows him to sit at the table with him, share a cup of coffee, and asks him what he can do. What can I do for you? And this man prays as if he's sitting across from his uncle, not afraid to ask for anything, not afraid to be thankful for anything, not afraid to open his heart. And when he prays for the congregation, you are there. You are right there, a member of that table. He taught his son to pray that way. And his son prays in the same manner. His name is Wes Borders. His son's name is Matthew. And now people in Kentucky, and whoever it might listen to this sermon online later, know about this man but who taught Wes how to pray was it his dad was it his grandfather was it just one of the other guys that he grew up going to church with 
I don't even know. But whoever it was that taught him to pray has allowed me to worship God with Wes in that way. I don't even know how many people I impact. You don't know how many people you strengthen when you bow your head to worship your God. So don't stop. Do not be afraid to worship knowing that this is not your homeland, that you have a better place to be, that you need to be the example for the world because they don't have a good one. And there is no way for us to know how many apples are in the seed. We're in verse 22. By faith, Joseph, at the end of his life, made mention of the exodus of the Israelites and gave directions concerning his bones. God will save my soul. There will be a day of delivery, and one day this pilgrimage will end. The blessing is given to Abraham, and it is realized in our salvation. Because he promised he must save me. Because he promised he must save you. God will always be faithful to his promises. And we should take assurance in faith that as we submit, as we, verse 6, draw near to God in faith, believe that he will reward those who do. Faith recognizes real power and those who are really powerful. So you have verses 23 to 28 in the discussion of Moses being saved from the king. The king's edict. And that section ends with actually fearing the one who can destroy. And if you'll look in your scripture, destroyer probably is capitalized, is it not? There at the end of verse 28 so that the destroyer of the firstborn might not touch them. The actual death that we must fear is not the one on this earth, as the king may order the death of the firstborn. The death we must fear comes from the one who chooses eternal life, or the one who honors eternal life, and the one who has the power to refuse. Faith delivers in verse 29. By faith, the people crossed the Red Sea on dry land, but the Egyptians could not. You have two different examples used here. I want you to notice that in both of these examples, you have two sides of the story. You have those who are saved in the people and the Egyptians, and also Rahab and her family, and those who are not. Both of these individuals are in perilous situations. Both of these individuals or these groups of individuals are surrounded by death. And yet they do not die. They will not die. God will deliver those who seek Him from lesser destroyers. And that though everything around me may be crumbling and everyone around me may perish eternally, if I'm doing what I ought to do, if I have the faith that I ought to have, God will save me. Don't you see? God always provides. And so you get to verse 32 with a question that you may be thinking now. Uh, what more shall I say for time would fail me to tell of and then it continues to list people. And when it gets done listing people, it just lists events. Time after time, story after story, song after song. God always delivers those who are faithful to Him. God always punishes those who have no faith in Him. God always rewards the faithful. All of these people trusted in God before Jesus even lived. Now knowing who Jesus is, it should be easier for us. You get to see the ways that God has blessed them, the ways that God has always kept His promises, and even more on top of that, you get to see that He brought about His Son to offer us salvation. 
they didn't get that. Verse 39, all of these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better for us, that apart from us, they should not be perfect. Something better for you. Something better for you than Abel got. Something better for you than Noah. Better than Sarah. Better than Rahab. Therefore, begin the next chapter. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of God. Yes, because Jesus came to this earth and was murdered for your soul. We can have faith to draw near to God. And Jesus will should be the foundation of our faith. And because of Jesus, we should know that we can have salvation. But it's more than just the founder that's mentioned here. It's also the perfecter. What does perfection mean? It doesn't mean pure. It means fully completed meaning that your faith will have to grow. It'll have to grow from the day that it started until the day that it is perfected, completed in the Christ. Therefore, lay aside all the baggage. Aren't you tired of it anyway? If we have faith in God, then we can develop senioritis, short-timers syndrome, we can develop that attitude of, I'm out of here soon. I won't have to deal with the politics anymore. I won't have to deal with Facebook anymore. I won't have to quickly scroll through those TikToks anymore. I won't have to put up with things breaking, failing, aching, hurting, not working. I won't have to put up with people dying anymore. And I know my God will save me. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. I'm short on time for the other side. I want to be holy like these individuals are holy. I want to be able to bless people the way that people were blessed in this to build faith. How? How do I do that? We go back to verse 6. And without faith it is impossible to please Him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who seek Him. If you have not been saved or if you question your place with God right now, there's two things I want you to do. They both come out of verse 6. Do you believe that God exists? And in that, when you get to the next chapter, do you believe that Jesus will save your soul? Then if you want to be right with Him, if you want to receive the reward of those who seek Him, seek Him. If you have any question on how to do that, I'll be happy to talk to you after we get done here. Pull up to the front. Come talk to me. Email, text, call. But let verse 6 either build your faith or hurt your feelings. Without faith, it is impossible to please Him. How is your faith? I don't have faith like Abraham, you might be saying. I don't have faith like Enoch for sure. He walked with God and was not. That's not the kind of faith that I have. I don't have faith like Isaac or Joseph or Jacob. All right. Maybe not. Look at verse 29. Who do you read of there? The people of Israel who are crossing through the Red Sea. How many of them made it to the promised land? Two. Two men and their families. That's it. All of those who by faith crossed through the Red Sea and were saved over the Egyptians were the most complaining, irritating, babalic kids in the entire world. And none of them made it to the promised land. There were two families. 
out of the estimated 2.2 million that walked through there. Can you have faith like any of them? How about Barak in verse 32? Who didn't want to go to battle and made a woman lead him. And I understand that culture is different now than it was then, but it was extremely shameful for him. And it is said in Scripture that she's the one who's going to get the credit. That judge being Deborah. What about Samson? Name one good thing about Samson. And if you can, it's that God favored him. He's a womanizer. He's a liar. He's a covenant breaker. The only thing that he actually does positively in Scripture is take revenge for himself. Or how about Jephthah? Who, if God gives me the victory, I'll sacrifice the first thing that comes out of my house. And later fulfills that promise by killing his daughter. It may be difficult for us to feel close to someone like Noah. But included in this list are not just those who are so great but also those who are without God, not great at all, not good people at all, not good examples at all. Son, either one of you, don't be like Jephthah. If God gives you a victory, thank God, but don't kill anything because of it, especially not your children. These are not examples you may want to follow in their actions. They drew near to God in faith. They acted according to their faith. And imperfect as they were, they were pleasing to God. Imperfect as we are, we can be pleasing to God. And if you need to fix anything between you and your God, if you need your faith restored, make it known.